morning, uh, eSIMS Engineering uh, subscribers. I hope that you are having a wonderful day. Today, I want to uh, go back into our computer science uh, PLTW curriculum and look over one part of assignment 211, Rise of the Internet. Uh, this is particular is the second part of the assignment where we are looking at IP and DNS or domain name servers and internet protocol. So um, we're really just going to kind of look through these questions. The rest of the assignment is pretty straightforward and your teacher uh, should have been able to do that demonstration with packet switching uh, in the previous part. And now we're on a part that kind of involves a little bit of math and a little bit of understanding with regards to IP addresses. So. Um, Let's start with number 12, and we just want to talk about uh, IPv4, Internet Protocol version 4. So if we, if we highlight our mouse over it and we click it, it'll say that it's the version 4 dom dominant protocol for routing traffic on the Internet to and from addresses using dotted decimal notation such as that. So we're going to talk about this dotted decimal notation and what it means. Uh, IPv4, IPv4 excuse me, uses a 32-bit address for each unique device. That means that in binary, if we switch over to my notepad real fast, in binary, basically, the way a IP address looks to a computer is more like this. Yeah, it could be like, I'm just making these, these numbers up, right? And then that works, right? So that really is an IPv4 address to a computer. How we usually see it or communicate it is using this dotted decimal notation. So if, I, if I'm not going to convert these numbers off, top, off the top of my head right away, but these binary numbers, if they were written as decimal numbers, then an example that we would look at and see an IP address would be like 168.0.0, uh, sorry, 50.11, all right? That's an example of an IPv4 address. And we can kind of say, well, it's IPv4 and you know, we have four numbers. And that's kind of a coincidence. It's really the version number. It's the different iterations of IP uh, protocol that we have been through. Um, and the, but this right now is currently, and still is in 2018, a more prominent IP uh, uh, routing system. So again, this is how it looks in binary. And the reason it's a 32-bit address is because every number is separated by, whoops, I forgot one here, is every number is separated by uh, 8 bits. So you have 8 bits here, you have 8 bits here, 8 bits here, 8 bits there. So that's a 32-bit address, okay? So the question number 12 is really asking you, um, how many devices can have a unique uh, address in IPv4? Well, there's really two ways that we can kind of understand this question. We think of it, we could think of it as using combinatorics, which means that since there are two possibilities in every single spot, two possibilities in every position, right? Either zero or one, okay? And since there are 32 positions, combinatorics says that the amount of available combinations is two to the n, right? Two to the n. So if there's 32 positions, that means that two to the 32 different IP addresses are possible. And if I whip out my calculator real fast, we can see that if I do 2 to the 32nd, oops, I forgot to hit the Y key, there we go, I'm going to get a possible amount as 4,294,967,296, okay? 4,294,967,296, right? I said 1,000 before, but that's okay. All right, let me just edit this and make some commas here so we can kind of separate that. There we go. Okay. So again, very large, seemingly large amount of IP addresses, right? However, it is important to know that especially considering local versus internet traffic, right? There are a discrete amount of devices that are on the internet. So it is very possible that we may at any given point run out of IP addresses or have multiple IP addresses uh, masking the same. So you can imagine the possibilities for errors and the possibilities for attacks when there's IP address conflicts. That means that two devices are claiming to have the same IP address, right? That means that internet packets sent from one area can be redirected unintentionally to somewhere where they're not supposed to be. So, you know, you can, you can kind of get into some of those possibilities with this, with, with this, uh, this realization. Four billion IP addresses may sound like a lot, in other words, right? And it kind of is. Now, if we increase it to IPv6, okay? Now, IPv6 uses hexadecimal notation, right? So we have, instead of um, being able to write dotted decimal, we actually will specify in hexadecimal. So we would specify four different, sorry, five different 
hexadecimal numbers, or better again, to think about using it in binary, we think about 128 bits. So if I just basically, real quick, just grab this IP address right here, and I'm going to put a period, oops, I'm going to try to put a period at the end of this, and oops, hold on, that's what I'm trying to do, that one, I would like to edit this one, let's see here, dot period, okay, there we go, I have to just expand this, right, so if I were to copy this and then paste it one, two, three more times, sorry for the way the formatting works on this, but that's okay, I'll just put it down here for now. I obviously cannot fit this on one line unless I reduce the color of my, or the size of my font. But this is an example of a de of a decimal, uh, sorry, decimal binary uh, IPv6 right here. I can't. I, I'm not even sure if I can make the font small, small enough. Oh, there we go. Eight point font. Eight point font will do it. <laughs> All right. And if I expand this window just a little bit more, I can fit. There we go. That's 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 pretty good. All right. So that's a binary representation of an IPv6 address. Okay. There are 128 bits in this, right? So it's four times longer than an IPv4 address. That doesn't necessarily mean, of course, that there are four times as many possibilities because, again, since combinatorics, every time you add a spot, you actually double the amount. So if I were to try to put this into the calculator, I most certainly would get a something in scientific notation. So if I do that to y, xy128, I get 3.4 times 10 to the 38. 3.4 times 10 to the 38. So IPv6, that means that we could theoretically have 10 to the 38, um, one, you know, 3.4 times 10 to the 38 possible uh, devices connected to the internet and have each having their own address. And obviously, you know, we, we, are, we do have quite a few electronic devices, each and every one of us that are connected to the internet. So it's certainly possible to fathom how many devices can be connected to the internet at the same time using IPv6 that allows for a great deal of expansion uh, for internet connectivity. Now, IP addresses. Well, here's the thing. You don't know if you realize this or not, but the address for, like, and you know, we can use YouTube since you're here on YouTube, or at least you're watching this from another place that is linking to YouTube. YouTube's IP address for accessing its main servers is one of these, it's an IPv4, it's an IPv6, probably an IPv6 now, but not really sure. I have to look up in the future activity when, the, when you uh, use uh, the cloud server to, uh, to check out the IP addresses uh, for specific sites. But anyway, I digress. So accessing and having to memorize numerous IP addresses would be very difficult. So that's where the domain name system comes in, or DNS. You may have heard of this before. It's basically a system that names resources on the internet. It's, the, it's responsible for you to, it's basically responsible for you being able to type in youtube.com to go to YouTube as opposed to having to type in 176.1 you know, and so forth, right? So, and no, I don't know if that's the actual IP address for YouTube. It probably isn't. Um, <laughs> 176 at least first. So domain names that you're familiar with, and the way that, that the naming system works is there's these top level domains. Top level domains like .com, .net, .org are all examples that are, there's an organizational structure basically where all of the dot com um, names, all the dot com sites and addresses are under one heading. Think of it like Bloom's taxonomy, but for electronics basically. So all of the dot coms, let me kind of show this to you a little bit. You know, you have all your dot coms here. And then from your dot coms, you will have all the sites that end in dot com, such as Amazon.com, YouTube.com, Google.com, and so forth, right? And over here, you'll have .NET, all of the .NET uh, sites, okay? And they could be any number of .NET, and none of them are coming off the top of my head, believe it or not, other than my own do district. Let's shout out to my district right there, nhps.net, right? Then there's also .edu, right? .edu, a lot of colleges and universities use edu. So there's uconn.edu, there's sacredheart.edu, shout out to the universities that taught me everything I know about education. Um, no, so and those are and there obviously are many other top-level domains that now exist. Uh, but even the early days of the internet, actually, really, .com, .net, .org, and .edu were the four most popular top-level domains. Um, that top-level domain, like US, can create second-level domains, such as as I mentioned before. These are all second-level domains, right? So Amazon.com, Amazon is in control of this domain 
And Amazon can also create what's known as a subdomain. So Amazon could create, for example, smile.amazon.com, uh, fbo.amazon.com. I don't know if that's an actual site, but I do know a couple people that do FPO and FBO on Amazon um, and so forth, right? So um, maybe even AWS, aws.amazon.com. I believe that's the website. So those are all third level domains, but off of Amazon. So basically you have this big tree. You have a tree with all of the top level domains on the top. And then you have from those top level domains, second level domains, basically the or owner of the organization would create a second level domain. And then from there, they can create further smaller third level and even possibly fourth level domains. It's very interesting to look at. You'll look at in the next activity, breaking down a web address and you'll kind of talk about what, um, what, what the domain structure is like for that and who, who is the owner of the domain and what top level domain they belong to and so forth. So, which do domain would have the authority to create the domain clerk.house.gov? And the correct answer to this is actually is house, right? Because house being the second level domain of top level domain gov means that they can create clerk as a third level domain. Now, IP addresses are also hierarchical, right? They're assigned in blocks of sequential addresses. If an organization has allocated the 12.65.124.x, that means that they are able to assign the IP address 12.65.124.34 to a particular computer. Who gets to decide what computer is addressed by 20864123.4? So whoever gets to decide that is the owner of that particular um, that, that particular hierarchy. So for example, 208.64.123 is most likely an organization of some sort, and they are allowed to allocate up to 255 different devices using this last digit. This is also true if you look at it and you know your IP address at your home network, you'll notice that most of the uh, most of the, the addresses that are in your house, if you have multiple devices hooked up to the internet, have this similar hierarchy. That last digit usually, and that's not always true, but usually is the one that has um, has the, the, the difference, right? The first two, th sorry, first three spots, assuming IPv4, are usually the same. Now, Name servers, they keep track of the IP addresses that correspond to the giving domain name. This is what I mentioned before. YouTube.com is really an IP address. Um, so name servers allow you to type in YouTube. DNS is what controls what organization all of those domains fall under. Okay, so I apologize. I, I kind of may have said that a little bit confusing earlier. I may have mentioned the concept of name servers without actually mentioning the term. So name servers, computer dedicated to providing responses for requests for domain name information. So they keep track of the IP address. Think of it as a giant address book, okay? Each of the name servers, each of the top level domains have their own name server to govern what IP addresses go to what websites. Uh, what name server would make, contain the IP address for the en.wikipedia.org name server? And of course, the answer here, I kind of skipped this part here, cnn.com's name server IP, IP address can be found on the .com name server, right? Well, what name server would contain the IP address for en.wikipedia.org or Wikipedia? And the answer is the .org website, uh, what name server. Now, this last question here, we'll kind of end the video on this question. Delegation and autonomy allow systems to grow. Both IP and domain name systems are hierarchical and delegate autonomous authority to lower level levels in the hierarchy. This is a strategy for letting a system scale. That means that the growth of the internet is theoretically uh, continuous and, and expandable. How well system scales it depends on how well it works as it grows. These two systems work in parallel with each other and have worked well even as the internet has grown so quickly. Delegation of authority lets the internet scale without becoming bogged down because domain owners can create each and sorry can create and keep track of their own subdomains. To understand this important concept of how computing systems can grow, think about an imaginary school that can build new corridors and rooms as it enrolls more students and hires teachers. As the school grows, it maintains only one office. The school can grow by delegating certain responsibilities to teachers or to students. Some responsibilities that are maintained by the, some responsibilities are maintained are retained by the main office. What's an example of a responsibility that's delegated to teachers or students in your school? So this is a possibility. For example, maybe attendance, right? Teachers take attendance in the morning and then they report that attendance to the main office. So the main office can can create a list of uh, who is in in the building. Your responsibility as students could be to get to class on time so that um, you are being a responsible member of, this, of the community and not somebody who's causing trouble. Uh, give an example of responsibilities that retained by the main office in your school. That would be discipline, giving dis suspensions, detentions, um, calling home for attendance issues, uh, perhaps even giving failure notices. Those are all examples of things that are maintained by that. Um, what is the impact of these responsibilities if the school grew to a thousand times its size? So again, you think about your school. If your school 
increased in size so big that it was 1,000 times. If you had a whole enrollment of 100 students, now all of a sudden you've got an enrollment of 100,000 students, right? Kind of difficult to picture, I'm sure, but what these, what responsibilities, having teachers taking attendance and having students being to class on time, how would that impact your school and how would that make there? So you can kind of think about that. All right, so that pretty much covers this particular part of the assignment. I will be back for 212 to give you some more insights onto Fire, well, what was Firebug, which is now Firefox Developer Tools, but we'll get to that in that video. In the meantime, please like and subscribe uh, to eSIMS Engineering. We are almost at 200 subscribers as of the recording of this video, and I'm really excited to, uh, to be able to share this information with you uh, as part of the po Project Lead the Way uh, curriculum and being a support for that. So if you ever have questions, please comment what those questions are, and please check out the other videos for computer science in the playlist that this video is in. I hope you have a wonderful day. Don't forget to be awesome.